Okay, so we are now live on YouTube, but we've had to use a different link. So I'll just update. Uh, so I'm just updating a new link. Uh, I'm just confirming that it's working. Um, and we should be <laughs> okay so let's get started uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining and waiting patiently um, you know there's always technical pitches that we need to be prepared for so good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We are talking today on accessible housing, basic premise for interdependent living. Let me first start by introducing our panelists. And uh, you know we are being supported by uh, Rajesh and uh, Fiza. Uh, so to start with, we have with us uh, Poonam Natrajan, who's the founder of Vidya Sagar. Uh, can you wave? Uh, former chairperson, National Trust, uh, MSJE, Government of India, and pioneer of services for persons with disability, which is a pioneer definitely and been in this field for a very long time. Uh, we have with us Shivani Gupta, who is the founder of Accessibility, uh, self-advocate, and also the lead facilitator for Tara training, which you will hear about later. Uh, we have Krishna Kumari, who is a special educator and rehab uh, professional, project associate at uh, Tara uh, at Vidya Sagar, and Vedavali, who is the project associate at Tara Vidya Sagar, supported by Rajesh as the sign language interpreter. And uh, sorry, and uh, Ved. Where's Fiza? Sorry, Fiza is not visible. Fiza is helping us with the uh, captioning. So, okay. Um, okay. So, uh, let me also spotlight. So, we've had to deal with some figuring out how this will work with uh, to make it uh, so we will all go off video and only Rajesh the interpreter will be visible and I'm going to spotlight him so we've just covered all the panelists uh, already and uh, I'm also trying to share the link with uh, uh, sorry uh, Veda can you just share the link uh, YouTube link uh, from the top with uh, Smita on WhatsApp if possible thanks um, so yeah, just a quick intro on Patients Engage for those of you who don't know us uh, and a quick recap. Patients Engage is non-blind platform operational for five years. We are focused on holistic and evidence-based management of chronic conditions and disabilities from the perspective of the person with the condition or disability and family caregivers. We believe in the value of lived experiences and how being engaged and proactive leads to being empowered and having better quality of life. Uh, in addition to the content on our website, we have also been doing webinars on a wide range of conditions and topics. These allow you, our audience, to interact with experts with lived experiences as well as professionals in the field. 
Um, these are some of the sample of some of the webinars we have done on topics, for instance, related to developmental disabilities. Uh, and on the next slide, uh, we have links on how you can engage and connect with us. So we are on all the social media platforms. You can also join us on the Diversity and Disability Community Forum on patientsengage.com. And you can also download the uh, Android app. If you have any experience to share or a topic to suggest, you can write to us at editor at patientsengage.com. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, to quick guide, guidance to the attendees, uh, you know, the information here, if at all, there is nothing medical today, but, you know, if something comes up, it is not to be treated as medical advice. Uh, it's based on the experience of panelists, and this session will be recorded. In fact, it's already being recorded. If you are logged into Zoom, you can post your questions on the Q&A. If you are on YouTube, post the comments, questions on the live feed. As I said, we also have for the first time Rajesh as a sign language interpreter and Fiza who's helping with live captioning. So a big thank you to uh, Krishna Veda and the Vidya Sagar, Poonam, et cetera, to you know, enable our first accessible webinar. Um, as quick uh, introduction on Vidya Sagar, we've been collaborating with them. Uh, they are a rights-based organization who've been who has uh, been around since 1985. And as part of their emphasis on creating awareness in the community on issues related to disability and advocating for persons, rights of persons with disabilities, we have also been working uh, with them on these topics and helping uh, you know, their outreach uh, and get these concepts across uh, to a wider audience uh, you know, together. As part of this series, we have talked about the effect of disability on self-esteem and confidence, the effect of attitudinal and environmental barriers and the lack of information, the journey through acceptance to self-advocacy, the role of technology, support, and social circles. We've also talked about how presenting choices in the appropriate way enables persons with disability to decide and learn decision-making and how augmented and assistive communication technology and techniques allow, again, persons with disability to communicate, socialize, and make decisions, and how this decision-making builds self-esteem and shapes personality. And today we continue as part of the same series into how there are other aspects of disability that we have not considered. So while there has been a lot of discussion and advocacy around accessibility in public spaces, one area that has been neglected are homes themselves. We typically counter that by adding more bodies. We you know, try and get attendance, we get support staff, we put in family members, you know, pitch in to support. But is that enough to enable independent participation in activities of daily living and domestic activities and a feeling of independence, right? This has been further accentuated during the COVID lockdown when we've all had to hunker down at home for extended periods, coupled with the absence of domestic help and supportive care. This is therefore a good time for us to look at why and how homes can be made accessible for persons with different and varying degrees of disability. So that's why we are here today to talk about this topic. Uh, let's start with you, uh, Poonam. Uh, so she'll probably not be visible, but you'll listen to her and, uh, and you'll continue to see Rajesh. So Poonam, can you first unpack interdependent living and how the idea of Tara came about and what it tries to achieve? Yeah. Thanks, Aparna. Uh, I have a small request. Can you, sure. can you uh, go in a little lesson, please? Sorry, a you slide, need us to go. Later. Yeah, a little slower. A little slower. Yeah, slow. Okay. Thanks, Sorry. you, Aparna. Yeah. Good Thanks. afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody and a very warm welcome to this webinar. Tara which is, stands for Team for Accessibility and Reasonable Accommodation, is the accessible housing services that are part of a new project at Vidya Sagar. 
uh, we are trying to develop a resource center for living independently in the community. This is called BLISS. It stands for Begin to Live Interdependently with Support Systems. In this project, there are nine pillars or departments which have been planned, which will work together to create support systems for adults with disabilities. This was conceptualized after a needs assessment survey of 110 adults with disabilities and their families. We have chosen to use the word interdependence instead of independence. This is because that is the way of the world. The give and take is our way of life. We are all interdependent on one another. We all develop our own support circles and use many support systems which help us to live a happy and fulfilled life. Interdependence does not mean lack of independence or lack of self-determination. Unfortunately, people with disabilities many times are not able to create for themselves the support they require. Developing friendships and relationships to build support circles is a big challenge. Therefore, it is generally assumed that they cannot live independently. We are hoping that this resource center fills that gap and brings a better understanding to the word independence and how it must be looked at from the lens of interdependence. So the, this project, this resource center is being set up for many reasons. First of all, there are very few services and support systems for adults with disabilities in our country. And we need to develop these systems in the community and also ensure that they're replicable in other parts of the country as well. Secondly, when I was at the National Trust, I felt that the question that the trust had been formed for was not really answered. The main question is, what happens to my child when I'm no more? When the parents get old, ill, or pass away, who will care and support for the person with disability? In fact, today in this uh, pandemic, that's a big question being asked, especially in the story of Mahendran, where his, both his parents had to be taken away to a quarantine center and this young man with intellectual disability was left alone to fend for himself and he just couldn't uh, he wasn't able to until his mother came back and the third reason is to find adequate answers for deinstitutionalization in delhi there's a home for children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are found abandoned on the streets this home is overcrowded. It was planned for 350 residents, but has more than 1,100. There was a PIL that it should be reorganized and residents should live with dignity and have a productive life in the community. In the court, the judge asked for an example of community living. We had nothing to show him in our country. Therefore, this we are hoping that Bliss is, creates a demonstrable model of support systems and group homes. One of the pillars of Bliss is Tara. It stands for Team for Accessibility and Reasonable Accommodation. And the main objective of the team is to work on making homes and workplaces that are the personal spaces of people with disabilities accessible. Before launching the training for this project, we did a survey among people with disabilities and found a large number of people of all disabilities needed access, but felt there was no solution and they also did not want to trouble their family members. 
Therefore, working on family dynamics has been an important part of our training. We are hoping that Tara is able to fill an important need for community living. We are trying to build a robust knowledge and experience base. So do reach out to the team for any issues in home and workplace modification. We can also offer training for other organizations in different parts of the country. Yeah, thank you. Let me unmute. Let me unmute myself. Um, okay, so moving on to uh, let's have Shivani joining us. Um, Shivani, can we understand whether accessible homes are supported by UNCRPD and RPDA? And I think uh, Krishna is just loading the slides. I'm getting some feedback that the audio is not visible on YouTube, but let me check. But go ahead, uh, Krishna and okay. uh, Shivani. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be a part of this webinar. And I think uh, just seeing the number of participants we have shows how important and close uh, this issue is to our hearts. And uh, I'm just going to wait for Veda to uh, put on my presentation. In the meantime, I'd just I'd like to use the time to introduce myself quickly. Uh, uh, I am a person with disabilities myself. I have worked in the area of accessibility for over 20 years, and that's been my passion. And uh, it's like Poonam D when, uh, you know, she conceptualized bliss. Uh, she contacted me if I wanted to be, uh, you know, I wanted to be the lead trainer for the Tara training. And I'm really glad that I took the opportunity and I learned a lot. And uh, yeah, so that was fantastic. And I'm gonna just share some things that I learned along the way uh, from the training and otherwise. So, uh, Krishna, yeah, can you go to the second slide? Yeah, that's the second. So the, uh, the basically three points that I'm going to cover in my presentation. Poonamdi already told us that people with disabilities want their homes to be more responsive and accessible to them uh, and to uh, you know, address their specific requirements. But um, because of several reasons, our homes are not accessible. And uh, also there is no demand in, in, in uh, our sector or generally in the disability movement for making homes accessible. So just looking at those uh, areas, I'm gonna present first, I will talk about whether accessible homes and home modification are a right for us and whether the legislation addresses it. Second, I would brief. Uh, I would briefly, uh, you know, provide some basic understanding of, of what are accessible homes and what are home modifications. And finally, I'm going to discuss that how to take this forward, uh, take this issue forward, and uh, share the experience of the Tara training and why it was designed the way it was. Uh, so going to the uh, first point is, uh, is having an accessible home supported by our legislation. Yeah, can you change the slide? So considering that there has never been a demand for accessible homes raised uh, for persons with disabilities, 
I mean, I won't say never, I think that's a strong word. Maybe I should say that there hasn't been a significant demand raised for accessible homes by persons with disabilities, their organizations, or their families. And as a result, it is not surprising that it does not find a place in the new rights of persons with disabilities act. So, uh, however, I would like to argue that accessible homes are a human right for us, persons with disabilities. So uh, to make my point, I would uh, first like to establish that adequate housing is a human right. And housing is adequate for persons with disabilities only if it is accessible. So that's my reasoning that I'm going to follow. So access to adequate housing, according to the international law, is a basic human right accepted way back in 1948 by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. However, the UDHR is a non-binding document. So that means that the countries do not, are not obliged to uh, follow what the UDHR is saying. However, in 1985, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is a binding legislation for nation, also recognize adequate housing as a human right. So therefore, by international law, definitely adequate housing is uh, considered a human right. Can we go to the next slide? So the uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights actually in its uh, general comment, uh, <laughs> specifically General Comment 7 and 4, has interpreted what adequate housing means. The covenant interprets the right to adequate housing as a right to live somewhere in security, peace, and dignity. Uh, and uh, persons with uh, disabilities uh, very well know that uh, practical application of these three criteria are closely linked to housing being accessible. Then the covenant also requires that people should be free from forced eviction, which people with disabilities often face, especially in the case of rented accommodation. Adequate housing should enable uh, people right to privacy and family which again in the case of persons with disabilities is often ignored. And uh, I myself have come across several cases, especially in low income housing, where the disabled family member is housed outside in the veranda or even just outside the house because the house itself is too small uh, to accommodate either their bed or the wheelchair and thus clearly denying them the right of privacy or family. So the covenant also requires that adequate housing must uphold the right to choose one's residence and determine where to live. So considering uh, that this freedom most often uh, is denied for persons with disabilities, and uh, it is well recognized that it is denied. It is, this particular uh, aspect has been elaborated in Article 19 of the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, and has been interpreted extensively in the general comment five of Article 19. Now the interpretation of the covenant further states eight essential requirements of the rights to adequate housing that very specifically address 
accessibility of homes for older persons and persons with disabilities. In addition to addressing other important aspects such as affordability, habitability, location, and so on. Now, these issues are very important for persons with disabilities, uh, for whom their spending capacity must, uh, may be much lesser. So therefore, affordability is very important. Also, there have been instances, uh, thankfully fewer in our countries, more in high income countries, though very prevalent in our countries as Punamdi mentioned, where residential facilities are built for persons with disabilities on the outskirts, on the outskirts of the city. And if they're located in the outskirts, then definitely there is no inclusion, uh, especially if there is no accessible transport. Krishna, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So the International Covenant on Social, Economic and Cultural Right establishes what adequate housing is and establishes it as a right. Now, the right to adequate housing has to be, has been already upheld by the Constitution of India in its interpretation of Article 21 on right to uh, life and liberty. But even more importantly for us, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities gives a framework to understand what right to adequate housing means for persons with disabilities. And again, uh, highlighting Article 19 of the Convention on living independently and being included in the community echoes what the covenant says, that persons with disabilities must have the choice to decide where and with whom they live. The precondition for making this choice real for many disabled people is making their homes accessible. Not having accessible homes often results in institutional, institutional like arrangement for persons with disabilities, even within their own homes. Krishna, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, Shivani, just a second. Uh, I think there are some people who are trying to log in, um, but I think we've reached our max capacity on Zoom. So if anybody is still trying to log in and is reaching out to you, um, please just send them the YouTube link and uh, they can join us through the YouTube link. Thank you. Yeah. So next I'd like to talk about what are accessible homes and what is home modification? So, uh, yeah, okay. So the purpose of home accessibility, adaptation, modification is basically to make homes of persons with disabilities and older persons more usable, comfortable and safe. Allowing them greater in, in, uh, independence to undertake different activities that they would like to within their homes. So can we go to the next slide? So no, just on this slide, uh, Krishna, the previous slide. So I've given two examples. One is of a ramp. Uh, the photograph shows a ramp, and there is a. This is a photograph that I took in uh, the rural parts of the country in Andhra Pradesh. And uh, so this uh, person on a wheelchair actually uh, got this ramp made by the community-based rehabilitation uh, project. So they supported him to make this ramp. Whereas the other uh, photograph you see is like more in terms of making kitchens accessible. And that course is just downloaded from the internet. But this also shows the difference between home modifications and accessibility. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, Krishna. Yeah. 
So uh, there are differences in what accessible homes are and what home modification is. And uh, basically accessible homes may be, may be seen as homes that are built based on accessibility or universal design standards that would require all doors to be wide, at least one of the toilet come shower to be accessible, kitchen slab to be lowered or at a certain height, etc. So accessible homes are standard driven, like public space accessibility. Whereas home modification, I would say that home modification in relation to accessible homes is similar to what reasonable accommodation is in relation to public space accessibility. So therefore, home modifications are customized solutions to suit individual requirements and are driven by the demand made by the disabled resident. So they are a, a customized solution and the demand has to come from the resident, whether it's a disabled resident, it could also be from the family. So that's the difference between accessible homes and reasonable accommodation. Um, Krishna, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So next I'd like to talk about how can we approach these issues? I mean, we know it's a right for us, but the rights of persons with disabilities has not addressed it adequately. However, the UNCRPD is saying, well, it is a right and persons with disabilities should have accessible homes. So how do we approach this issue? Uh, so accessible homes, as I said, are standard driven. Groups, organizations involved uh, in housing in the community at large to be made more aware that adequate what adequate housing is for persons with disabilities and the requirement to make them accessible for them. So there, there are, uh, you know, like developmental organizations are working on housing projects. So when they are working on housing projects, they must ensure that they are also accessible. They include accessible features in the design. Then the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act to recognize the right to accessible housing. And therefore, it requires an amendment. Accessibility standards uh, on accessible housing need to be developed. Public spaces have different requirements and definitely housing is different and needs to be addressed differently. And it needs to have its own standards and guidelines. And uh, implementation, uh, once we have the amendment and we have the standards, there needs to be implementation and accountability systems in place to ensure that they are implemented. So that's about accessible housing. However, home modification, I'm just taking a pause for the person captioning. Okay, so home modifications on the other hand, as I mentioned, are individual driven. The need for home modification must be recognized by the legislation for sure. Otherwise, we would never be able to modify our rented accommodation. Even in our own homes, we may be discouraged to build ramps and put elevators if required. So it has to be recognized by legislation. Home modification guidelines developed for, uh, must be developed for different disabilities. But what do home modification mean for different disabilities? And there has to be awareness raised about it. 
provision of home modification to be linked with existing housing schemes and additional innovative funds uh, may be uh, budgeted for to provide these. And uh, I'd like to just give an example of uh, the Indra Avas Yojana, for instance. Uh, the Yojana has a reservation uh, for persons with disabilities, a quota. However, it does not require that the houses should be accessible. Uh, then further resources such as information, uh, uh, assistive devices, etc., that may be used in making an individual more independent need to be compiled and training of persons to assess making homes more suitable to the needs of individuals with disabilities uh, must be available in the market. Yeah, can we change the slide? Krishna? Yes, yeah, she's done that, yeah. Okay, thanks. So uh, in the end, I would like to actually talk about the good example of Tara and uh, how the team was created. Poonambi already talked about uh, the, you know, the gap that existed in terms of a model and uh, why a team like a Tara team is important. Uh, I would like to talk more in terms of what kind of training happened. So basically it was a three month uh, extensive training with practical experience organized by Vidya Sagar in a technical partnership with accessibility. Uh, Krishna and Veda are both part of the training. In addition uh, to them, there were four other trainings and the trainees also included persons with disabilities. So the training had six modules uh, that were decided after several consultations with, uh, uh, you know, senior member of uh, Vidya Sagar uh, and consultation with other people, other professionals. And the modules were designed uh, recognizing that accessibility of public spaces is very different from addressing accessibility of personal spaces. So that was a basic understanding that we took when we designed these modules. So the module one, the first module was on rights of persons with disabilities in relation to independent living. The module aided to establish a right space understanding of accessible homes and included the understanding of the CRPD. In addition, uh, to the Indian Constitution, the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, and other schemes, rules, etc., that exist in the area of independent living. Module two was on understanding disability. The module aimed at creating an in-depth understanding of barriers faced by persons with disabilities, uh, persons from different disability constituencies, and may I remind you that according to our act, now there are 21 different types of disabilities that are recognized. So the module actually had self advocates from 21 different disabilities coming and sharing their lived experiences. So module three was on assistive devices and uh, technology. The aim of the module was to provide detailed information on assistive devices and technology, including communication, mobility, independent li living, accessibility aids, et cetera, uh, that can aid uh, independence. Uh, we also covered and addressed the process of procuring these and the gaps that exist in the system. Module four was on physical accessibility, where the trainees gained in-depth knowledge 
and understanding on all aspects related to physical accessibility and its implementation such as standards, uh, access audits, reading plans, and so on. Uh, module five was on managing dynamics. This module was very important from the context of interdependent living that Poonamdi talked about right in the beginning, uh, which implies that people live together and not alone, supporting each other. So in the case of persons with disabilities, they most often live with their families in the community. While offering home modification agreement of the family and at times of the community becomes important. And the trainees learned to manage and negotiate interpersonal dynamics in creating home modifications. The last module was on home modification itself that aimed at aligning all the knowledge that they had gained over these months to align it together, enabling them to provide home modifications. Uh, there were also practical experiences of home visits of accessible homes that the trainees got. They also worked on providing home modification in six homes that Krishna would be elaborating on after me. So I'm going to end with that and I would be happy to answer questions at the end of all the presentation and uh, I would just like to leave uh, my contact details on the screen. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thanks, Shivani. Um, I know we are kind of beyond our planned time, but while Krishna is loading uh, her set of slides, uh, there is a comment, Shivani. I don't know if you want to comment on it. Uh, RPD Act, Nilesh uh, Singhit says RPD Act may not have anything specifically to it existing homes be made accessible. However, 37 A and B provide 5% reservation for housing for PWD. This could be a basis to demand accessible housing. Yeah, I would completely agree with Nilesh. As I said, um, there is a reservation, there is a quota in all schemes for persons with disabilities, but what we really need to demand is that it needs to be coupled with accessibility. Otherwise, just getting a home allotment is not going to really help us to be right. independent. Right. And while again, Krishna is loading her screen, uh, one more question that's come up, uh, maybe we can take that. Can the RPDA 2016 be amended to mandate accessible housing? Oh, I think uh, Poonamdi may be more apt to answer that question. Sure. My sure. Uh, immediate response would be, I'm sure it can be. Yeah, yeah, I think I agree with Shivani. If, if um, there, there's never been enough demand in our country on homes being accessible, but I think if there is, and if, if we can build that kind of a consensus, then I, I think an amendment is possible. Why not? Right, thanks. Krishna, are you ready to start? Yeah, Parna, yes. We're not seeing your sliders yet. Can you see it now? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's uh, amazing to have this opportunity uh, to share experience and learning that we gained uh, through the Tara training program. I'm here to share with you the importance of home modification and the difference it could make in the lives of persons with disabilities and older persons. I'll be presenting five case studies that we did during the Tara course as a part of a practical study. I'm not going to touch upon all the detailed information. Instead, I'm going to share the comparative analysis of these case, uh, case studies from various perspectives and the impact that this old home modification uh, process could have. During a Tara training program, uh, as Shivani ma'am highlighted, 
we gained insight on all the 21 disabilities that had been identified under the RPWD Act. We looked at barriers and home modifications required for all the 21 disabilities. And the learning that each disability would need diverse modific home modification requirement. But for the practical study, we had the opportunity only to work with persons with multiple disabilities with a commonality that they were all wheelchair users. When we approach home modification, we can take into consideration four different yet interrelated aspects. First, we need to consider the aspirations of the individual with disabilities. Secondly, to understand their functional abilities and needs. Then the family dynamics. And finally, we look into the barriers in the environment, which includes both physical and attitudinal barriers. These factors are very important to consider when recommendations are made. Aspirations. All of us have aspirations, right? Our personal aspirations can contribute to developing as a person and becoming who we want to be. Aspirations may vary based on many different factors such as age, gender, education, socio-economic background, etc. This wheel here reflects the dream and aspirations expressed by five persons whom we were associated during our work. The first one, a young entrepreneur who runs a Montessori school and who wants to expand her work, a young dynamic graduate working in an NGO sector who wants to become more independent in her daily living activities, a happy couple, homemaker married to a journalist, both of them are persons with disabilities, a teenage girl, and a self-motivated advocate who wants to start cooking for herself in the hostel kitchen. We understood during the process uh, that the teenage girl has no aspirations as a result of a difficult socio-economic situation. She lives in the slum with five members, family members in a single room house. Both the parents are working hard to make hens meet, mother shuffling between day shift and father goes for night shift just to ensure at least one of them is with their daughter at all times. Such vulnerabilities have had an effect on this girl, leaving her hopeless without aspirations. Therefore, when we evaluated our stakeholders' home, we were driven by their aspirations. And in the case of no aspiration, we considered greater independence as their aspiration. This slide discusses the different reason why people want accessibility. If you look, uh, if you take a closer look at these case studies, it shows how diverse each person's abilities and inabilities are. As I mentioned in the introduction, our experience during the practical study was limited to persons with multiple disabilities only. As you could notice, most of them are persons with physical impairment who have limitations in mobility and require varied level of support to complete their ADLs. ADLs are activity for daily living. Each one of them has a varied level of functionality. If you take a look at uh, the case study number three, the homemaker, even though she's independent in all uh, you know, activity of her daily living, she finds accessing and reaching kitchen counters, top shelves, washing machine, difficult because she is a ground level mobility user. And in the teenage girl's example, she has difficulty in accessing the Indian toilet adaptation.
Ashwani ma'am also highlighted uh, the importance of uh, family dynamics. A house, you know, will always become a home as a result of the people living in it. Therefore, while the process of home modification, we have to require and respect the choice and preference of the individual with disability. But what's equally important is respecting the choice and comfort of other members living in the home. As a facilitator, we try to understand the needs of the person with disabilities and the family members. We negotiated the O modification solution through a collaborative and supportive decision-making process. I would like to uh, you know, make specific mention uh, of the two case study. The advocate who was living in the hostel and the young lady who lives in an apartment. In the first case, uh, to discuss and get inputs, we had to you know, um, approach all the hostel residents, the cooks using the kitchen because it's a common space to come up with solution that was acceptable by all. In the second case, in the case of the young lady, we needed to discuss with the parent and also meet all the resident of the housing block because it's a flat and uh, you know the association members to get their agreement uh, to build a ramp because it was common um, you know at the common entrance another important fact to be considered is the socio economic background of the family this plays a very major influence in bringing accessibility to personal spaces finances impact the decisions of the family. While uh, exploring recommendations, we had to take into consideration the choice of the uh, stakeholder, whether the family could afford it, and the environment, the usability factor, and the uh, durability factor. To state an example, in two situations, we encountered a similar challenge. Both the stakeholders had limited and functions and they had difficulty in bathing. The accommodation explored were height adjustable and shower to one of them and a car cleaning water pump electrical kit washer to the other. These suggestions were made considering their financial and environmental aspects. We had to take into many factors like whether it's a own or a rented space, whether they can make changes permanently or a temporary solution is required. This slide depicts the different barriers to accessibility, the obstacles that make it difficult, sometimes even impossible for persons with disabilities. I'm going to discuss the barriers and few reasonable rec recommendations that we explore during the practical study. This photograph here is the entrance uh, to the Montessori school that I had mentioned. The physical barrier here is the difficulty accessing in and out of the workspace, you know, because of the uh, steep ramp and the stairs at the entrance. While exploring solution, we had to consider various factors. Uh, the area in front of the stair is a common zone, which is ad adjacent to the flat entrance, which lead to another, you know, uh, flat uh, uh, house. Hence, the family was concerned about building a ramp or making any changes in the common area, uh, fearing that you know, people in the apartment may object. So here we have to deal with the attitudinal barrier uh, in the community also, which involves negotiating with the flat association members and also other flat owners. So in this case, taking all these considerations, we suggested a platform lift had to, uh, you know, as it would not require much breaking or construction compared to a permanent ramp. Again, the high cost was a concern. Hence, taking into consideration the family's economic requirement, an affordable solution was also suggested, which is a foldable ramp, which is effective and portable, which has both, if I, uh, you know, uh, the cost factor and also the portability factor. When, when I highlighted about the homemaker's difficulty, where she had, uh, you know, because she's a ground level mobility user, she also had difficulty in you know, um, taking clothes outside from the top load washing machine and uh, to dry the clothes. So the reasonable accommodation explored in the situation 
was a laundry grabber, uh, which was used to retrieve clothes from the washing machine and reach clothes, which is at, in the bottom of the tub. And another solution was a mounted ceiling hanger for drying clothes, uh, which is operated, uh, which has an easy to operate pulley system, which can be pulled up and down according to a height adjustment. This is the entrance uh, to the teenager's house, which is in the slum area. The first picture uh, you know, shows the entrance to the house. And, uh, and, and next to the door, you can see a narrow passage, which leads to the bathroom, uh, which is a common area. Mm, you know, this, because of the stairs, it was making it very inaccessible for her to move independently. She also had difficulty accessing the toilet space. Uh, and every time she has to be, uh, carried by a family member through this narrow corridor. And most of the time, there were a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, water filled and, you know, there were a lot of pots kept on the way because uh, of the water scarcity. So the solution that we explore uh, was a commode with a caster, which was uh, customized, which can be customized, suiting a specific needs and body measurement. And also considering the narrow uh, passage and you know, because it was a common space, we also explored uh, an option which is a flat foldable steel frame with height adjustment and detachable commode back, uh, bucket. So uh, you know, this can be easy for the parents to kind of hold it and use it only when she's accessing it. The next one, this is the kitchen space in the group home. Uh, many options were explored for making this an accessible kitchen. Um, we also had to, con uh, you know, make take into consideration uh, all the hostelites and cooks' feedback, uh, and putting together all this, we uh, came up with many, uh, you know, accessible features. I'm only going to highlight uh, some of them, uh, which are, uh, you know, kitchen countertop, basically the work surface that will be installed at uh, accessible height. Uh, and if you notice in the first picture, there is no base cabinet. So this will allow, you know, enough knee clearance and toe clearance for uh, wheelchair users. The next one uh, for the kitchen sink, a 360 degrees rotatable holder with spray and uh, shower function for easy reach and access. And also it helps to clean, you know, deep vessels. And the last one is, uh, you know, pull down spice rack. And... Uh, you can also see a transparent multi-storage container with handle, which makes it easy to hold. And it has four, uh, you know, uh, cabinet, you know, uh, to kind of uh, store four assorted items uh, according to the usability and, you know, the frequency of the items which is being used. Barrier-free accessibility in home, as well as other environment are the need of the hour now. This means that the person is only disabled to the extent that there are barriers in their functioning. If the barriers are eliminated, such as providing a ramp instead of the stairs, the, in all the case study we saw, like, you know, they, most of them had difficulty uh, getting in and uh, out of the home or workspace. So in those cases, if we provide a ramp, definitely, you know, it becomes easier for them. So then the disability will not be a challenge anymore. Finally, to kind of sum up from all the case studies, uh, I would like to reiterate that uh, home modification is individual driven. Shivani ma'am also highlighted the importance of it. Unlike accessibility, this is standard driven, uh, you know, which is inclusive of standard guidelines, whereas home modification includes accessibility, along with other com components like social, cultural, all these goes into consideration when we look out for a uh, solution. And uh, person specific needs. There are different reasons why people want disability, like in all these five case studies we saw. In O modification, what is possible depends on the person specific needs. It is not disability specific. The disability or the label doesn't matter here we need to explore specific modifications suiting each person's needs and differences and explore an individualistic solution. 
as each person's need is different definitely so should be the solution the solutions are you should be varied and uh, unique what works for one person may not suit another as everyone has different requirement when we suggest modifications we need to ensure that it fits the person's need whether it will pave way uh, for their aspiration whether it is agreeable with the family members and whether it meets their social economic background and the cultural aspect of the family and we also need to consider the different level of functionality and the rehabilitation that has been provided one of the important thing that we need to always remember is that creating opportunities is more important than just ruling down to solution and uh, finally family dynamics to think about everyone's need and uh, you know ensure to make that the family are a proactive uh, you know members in the whole process and also to take the effort to make them understand that there is a easier life and it is definitely possible so what we understood during our experience with these five people is that o modifications and improvements can help one to maintain the independence and provide economic benefits these in turn will provide enhanced self esteem and confidence promoting inclusiveness even a small change that sorry we make uh, krishna can, bring... can you hurry up and wind up we are already yeah, yeah. i i'm in the yeah, last thanks. text yeah. even a small change uh, that we make uh, can make a huge difference in respect to accessibility so let's remember from this webinar that this is the first step towards accessibility starting right from our homes thanks thanks uh... krishna and while uh, veda loads up her uh, uh slide uh i think we can take a couple of questions that have uh, come in so far um punam this is i guess a question for you can tara team train people in other parts of the country veda continue to set up please uh, i yeah punam, yeah yeah that actually that's the big question that we have been thinking about whether we could set up a online course would there be people wanting to do such courses uh, we have had a few questions from different uh, cities in the country but uh, we're still looking at it but certainly we would like to train in different parts of the country and uh, and try and see if more and more such teams can come up which can help with uh, breaking down barriers and making homes more accessible right thanks uh yeah krish uh, veda so can you talk us through i guess so uh, you know what is the model accessible home uh, that you created and demonstrated and uh, how it is in how it deals with various disabilities as well and not just uh you know motor and movement related sure uh, hi everyone uh, happy to connect with you all um in this discussion on emphasizing the need for accessible housing i feel happy uh, to talk about a milestone project of tara uh, and the impact it created uh, the project was basically a model accessible home Uh, which was established at Tamil Nadu Expo 2020. Uh, as part of the presentation, a short video tour will also be shown. Uh, the expo acted as a carrier to deliver the need for accessible homes uh, for independent living to the general public, and also to observe their acceptance of the same. So to begin with. basically uh, the expo is a yearly event which is organized by the tamil nadu tourism to tap in the festive spirit and it aims towards promotion of tourism uh, the fair accommodates stalls amusement rides and garment pavilions and among the garment pavilions uh, we collaborated with the department of the welfare of the differently abled government of tamil nadu Uh, 
Um, establishing such a model accessible home was a pilot initiative, which uh, we could make possible with uh, support from the government and uh, architectural support from City Works team. So speaking about how the project got evolved, uh, the project conceptualized from the Sambhav scheme of National Trust, which is a facility to showcase all assistive devices and technology available across the country. Uh, there's already an existing Sambhav center in Delhi, and we proposed the commissioner, uh, like the idea to the commissioner on bringing a similar center in Chennai. This is an upcoming project and we tentatively call it as the Museum of Possibilities, which will be a permanent display come demonstrative center of assistive aids and appliances. Inspired by Sambhav, uh, we organized a similar initiative at Anna University Chennai, commemorating World Disability Day on 3rd December 2019. Uh, the event was a one day program where uh, the assistive and adaptive aids were exhibited in a stall. We received an overwhelming reception. The initiative was also acknowledged by the State Commissionerate for the Differently Able, and it thus paved the way for the Accessible Home Project at the 46th India Tourist and Industrial Fair Island Grounds. Uh, so the expo was a 75 days exhibition which was inaugurated on December 22nd, and it extended till March 7th, 2020. So the comparatively, uh, there are initiatives taken to make public places accessible. Very less focus is drawn towards personal space accessibility. Hence, uh, the main objective was to raise awareness on the same as it seems to be an unattended need in the current scenario. And when it comes to facilitating the process of independent living, uh, we also realized it was equally important to respect the choice of the individual. Whenever uh, someone speaks of accessible homes, whether the online or other resources are concerned, we find most of them are from Western context. Hence, uh, we wanted to create the model accessible home completely in the Indian context with locally available resources. We wanted to enable people to realize that there are already so many items available in the market which can make our daily living much easier and independent. We focused on the following domains, uh, which included the independent living unit, uh, which had the living room, dining, uh, kitchen, bedroom, and bathroom, the leisure unit, uh, the education, and AAC, which is augmentative and alternative communication. And the other objective that we wanted to convey was bringing in accessibility to home need not be an immediate and one-shot process, but it can be achieved progressively. We can now watch a short tour video of the accessible home. Uh, so I think there's been a request for the PowerPoints. Uh, so yes, we can email it to all of you on Zoom for sure. Uh, those on YouTube, we will figure out how to uh, put up a link either on our respective pages or something like that. Uh, or you could subscribe, you could register on the Patients Engaged Diversity uh, group, then you will definitely get a copy as well. So go ahead, Veda, while you load the video. Just wanted to get that. So I'm, I'm just going to play the video. So this was the front view of the home. Uh, uh, we are not seeing, I think, I don't know if you guys are seeing on the YouTube, but we're not seeing the video. Okay. I think maybe it's better that you stop sharing this and reshare here. Yeah. Yeah, 
is it coming now? Yeah. I'm very conscious sure. that we are well beyond time. So just kind of get the key points out, please. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so as you can see, both ramp and stair access were provided. And two guides were appointed to brief on the functionality of the various aids which were displayed to the visitors in the various domains. As we enter, this was the section of the stall which had government and other organizations displaying their schemes and products for persons with disability. Uh, a tactile plan of the home was also made available and displayed at the center, at the entrance. You can now see the accessible living room. Uh, every aspect starting from the type of furniture used and its arrangement to the type of flooring, lighting, safe and barrier-free navigation was ensured. The demonstration products, shelves and switchboards were mounted at an accessible height. As we move from the living room comes the accessible dining and open kitchen area. Uh, this is just a closer look at the items which were displayed at the dining area, like a uh, two-handle mug, Weighted cup, some adapted spoons, etc. Yeah, moving on to the accessible kitchen. The kitchen platform was designed with no under counters, that is, uh, no slabs under the kitchen platform to ensure wheelchair accessibility. Uh, other key elements included uh, flexible kitchen faucet. Uh, pull down spice rack, pull out cutting board, and magnetic rack, to name a few. Uh, the majority of the products were designed on universal design uh, principles, ensuring that it uh, suits good people with uh, different abilities. Uh, for example, uh, if you could consider like the vegetable cutting board, which is shown now, it enables a user to fix the vegetable on the nails and he or she can do the chopping using one hand. Uh, it has also got those edges which can serve as reference for a person with visual challenges to move the chopped pieces to another container. The edges also serve um, to fix a bread slice while you spread jam or any other fillings. So among the items which were displayed, some were customized while others were directly procured from the local market. This is just a closer look of the various aids which were displayed, which included different types of slicers, cutters, uh, different bottle opening aids. Um, Stating another example for the universal design. Uh, this is a easy holding pen. Uh, the pen has got a spiral wire which is attached to it from a base, which can be fixed on a table. In case while writing, if the pen slips, the wire enables the person to easily pick and hold it back. Henceforth, it suits uh, persons who find it difficult in bending and even visually challenged. Moving on to the accessible bedroom. On the right side of the bed, a desk with education and AAC, which is the augmentative and alternative communication aids, were kept for display. Items displayed in this area included adjustable backrest, uh, uh, support for getting up from bed, bed pull up strap, adapted nail cutter, transfer board, etc. The video now shows the educational and AAC, that is augmentative and alternative communication aids. So the left corner of the bedroom leads to the accessible bathroom and dressing area, which is shown now. It included uh, permanent fittings at accessible height. 
few key elements included the collapsible dressing table, foldable shower seat, uh, portable jet spray, etc. I think we've lost Rajesh. Should I pause for a while? Uh, I don't know if he's coming back on. Yeah. Ah, he's back. He's back. Okay. He's back. Yeah. Go ahead. So these were some of the dressing aids which were kept for display, like uh, PC Pool Sock 8, Adapted Home, etc. So as mentioned earlier, the leisure unit was also included as part of the home. The leisure unit uh, domain covered music, uh, sports, and gardening. Veda, have you lost you? I think we've lost Veda. Um, okay, maybe we'll take a couple of questions in the meantime while she comes like back. Oh, you okay? You're back, Veda? Yeah, yeah, she seems to be back. Yeah. Hello, yeah. So yeah, go ahead, Veda. Yeah, so as part, uh, as part of the awareness building, an inclusive sports event was also organized during the Pongal holidays on 16th and 17th of January 2020. Uh, the general public were allowed to try out the adapted basketball, Boshia, which is a Paralympic game for wheelchair athletes, and adapted 19 ball. Aveda, you're not sharing any more screens, right? So can I just put everybody back on video? Uh, I just have a last slide to be included. So. Okay, all right. So these are few glimpses from the expo. Uh, it witnessed a steady flow of visitors. I think we are not seeing the video anymore. I, I suggest that we move on with the last slide and uh, sure. okay. yeah. So uh, sharing the impact uh, achieved through the Expo, uh, it served to be an excellent platform to build awareness on accessible housing. Uh, it enabled space for people to try out which assistive aid uh, would suit their needs. Hence, it opened doors to access possibilities, not only uh, persons with disabilities, but many others who tried out the products which were displayed and found it effective. It served as a platform for bringing all possibilities into reality. The exhibition recorded a foot count of around uh, 20,000 people, which included government officials, uh, disability sector professionals and stakeholders, school students, representatives from other organizations among others. Uh, through a single platform, we were successfully able to address different levels of audience. As part of the feedback system, a questionnaire was shared to the public on the necessity of accessible houses and their views on the same were kind of recorded and an overwhelming interest was uh, like monitored. The views reflected that accessible housing is a reality which would begin with mere acceptance and collaborative decision. Many even emphasize that uh, the government can bring in schemes 
to implement the same to the common people at uh, reduced cost. A comprehensive database of the products with image description along with cost and meta details was created and shared to the interested people who visited the stall and inquired on the procurement. So on an overall note, uh, we were successful in conveying that accessibility in personal spaces is not an unrealistic concept. Uh, it's an affordable reality which could be achieved in a progressive way. Right. So the, the database, well, just like last thing, the database mentioned earlier will be an ongoing process which uh, we will be maintaining and updating as we come across other new aids. So hence we are open to collaborate with individuals and organizations who would like to share the resources like existing models or ideas on adaptive and assistive aids. Uh, you can reach out to us using the details shown in the slide. Right. Thanks, uh, Veda. Can I request all the panelists to turn their video on now uh, so we can take the questions? So let me start. I think, Shivani, you've already marked one that you would like to take. Uh, Subhash said the National Building 2016 uh, code uh, provides that all public housing, whether private or government, will ensure accessibility. The code is being adopted in many states now. Uh, Shivani, you said you would like to answer that. So, yeah, I'd just like to point out that when we uh, look at the building bylaws of states, they exclude personal uh, homes. So, therefore, uh, it is not mandatory for personal homes to be accessible. Uh, so, even if we have the building codes, it's not going to really apply on those. Uh, of course, having the building codes is really fantastic and we need it, but there has to be, they have to be looked at from the perspective of accessible housing and demand to be created before any change. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Shivani. Um, there's, there's a question, I guess it's a comment and uh, I had a follow-up question. So persons with disabilities, some are self-advocates to speak for themselves, some are not. And their family members can find it very difficult to understand the need to make accessible homes. Uh, they say we are there to take care of them. They're also unaware of how uh, to you know, make the homes accessible as well as uh, how to kind of go about this. Uh, so I know the question was, how can Tara help? But I think I also have a follow-up question as to how can a person initiate such a conversation with family members? Because it can be sometimes quite challenging if, as, as uh, Umul said, that if they're not self-advocates. Um, so who's going to take that question? Oh, can, I, can I answer yeah. that? Apart sure, sure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, if you, if like when we kind of look out uh, through the presentation started from Konamaka till Veda, we always emphasize the importance of human elements. So it's just not the physical or the architectural changes uh, that matters here. So it's just the human element which uh, we consider the value uh, and the attitude that the family has been carrying. And also uh, when we consider the stakeholders, all the family, uh, we kind of uh, take into consideration their readiness to change and the barriers, like not only in terms of physical or barrier, like what, what is the barrier that is preventing them or resisting them, uh, you know, towards the change. So we recognize and respect a person's thinking. Uh, we believe that it's the uh, outcome of their, uh, you know, life experiences, belief system, and, you know, uh, cultural thinking. So we facilitate a lot of conversation, you know, dialoguing and, uh, you know, discussion with the entire family members individually and, you know, as a group. And, uh, you know, we basically enable acceptance of change to, through these conversations. And uh, to, towards the end, we don't go for unrealistic goals. We derive a very uh, smart goals, which are very specific, uh, measurable, achievable, and, you know, very relevant and time bound. And as Veda also mentioned, in a very progressive realization way, which is like 
we do a lot of you know suggestions but we ensure that it is prioritized and you know those changes can you know made like one uh, step at a time and uh, we elicit uh, you know a lot of motivation towards these change by uh, helping them to connect with lot of self advocates and people with disabilities and different forums so you know they could kind of engage uh, with these knowledge okay thanks krishna uh, sorry punam okay. you wanted to add something yeah yeah I, it's actually yeah just to add to what krishna said uh, you know it's just it, it, it looks like a very formidable thing you know changing the whole household but it's actually a barrier attitudinal barrier because once the family understands that the person can become more participant in the home they can help in the kitchen they can you know go all over the house they're not sitting in one place they can move around they can uh, participate in various activities of the household uh, families slowly tend to uh, become more uh, uh, want to actually participate and in thinking up of ideas of how to make it accessible so i think it's more about awareness creation and uh, telling them that it's it's possible and it's not going to cost the earth and it's not going right. to be something that take one year of some the whole household being topsy turvy or something it's just right. about how to reorganize ourselves simply right thanks thanks yeah. yeah shivani you are on mute you'll have to unmute yeah. to answer so i actually just want to add to what punam de and krishna have said is that accessible housing would also reduce the amount of care and support a disabled person requires at home because if we are able to make them more independent they would be able to do some of their activities of daily living themselves Correct. putting a lesser uh, you know less amount of care that the family requires so it makes right. a lot of sense for them right thanks thanks shivani um we've got a question consent of local self government is a precondition for construction of every building including a house is free accessibility being made mandatory for giving consent for construction i guess this is shivani you yeah, yeah. So as as i mentioned mm. uh if we go to our uh, building bylaws uh basically all everything is constructed in different states based on the building bylaws that they have now the building bylaws exempt personal living spaces mm. so personal homes are exempt from it so while we may say that the building bylaws need to follow uh, uh i mean everything needs to be accessible by as per the building bylaws but because personal homes are exempted by the bylaws then those accessibility criteria would not apply on personal right. homes right so at the moment it does not uh, i mean it's not mandatory to make your homes accessible right thanks and neither is it uh, mandatory for uh, you know municipality constructions like the dba and all those things to ensure that right. housing they provide is accessible right right uh there's two kind of similar questions uh and of course says this is most impressive can you consider a traveling exhibition uh what about sourcing the assistive devices but the other part is can tara training be offered in architectural schools too and somebody else says we need to make accessibility part of the architecture course can how do we go about it so who wants to i guess the traveling exhibition part i think punam you've kind of said yes uh, but we we'll have to look at digital traveling in these covid times uh, yes, yes. <laughs> but on the architecture course <laughs> any thoughts on that from either of you or anybody yeah yes, shivani well, yeah. so having worked in the area of accessibility for nearly 20 years uh oh. and having pushed and pushed and pushed architectural colleges to actually make universal design or accessibility as a core topic for uh, you know their course has not happened as yet it is mm. still a elective 
students can decide whether they want to take it if you approach right. the architectural colleges they say that uh, we uh, uh, we ensure that the field work or, or or the models and the drawings the practice that they have to do they have to address accessibility but right. yeah i don't think that is enough and uh, much more I mean, they really really need to address it as a core subject right right yeah okay. i think that will be a dream come true i want to add that if it can <laughs> actually part of architecture courses right so it's, i suppose it's something for the future yeah but i think it's worth keeping at it so uh, i don't understand this question but maybe you guys do what do you provide e certificate i guess it's do you provide e certificate right, i'm not sure yeah any certificate on what i guess the tara tara training tara if they training. become a yeah, yeah 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 we yeah. haven't actually the tara training has uh, we it, it's a vidya sagar training to uh, as a, as one part of a larger project which we are trying to do on independent living we we haven't yet really uh, gone that far to try and find out if we can get any formal certification on the tara training right or right. the people who did the tara training krishna krishna is already a special educator veda is an engineer bhavna is a graduate and hari shankar they uh, is a graduate who so two people with disabilities tara team is four people two people with disabilities and krishna and veda and mm. they 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 were not keen on a i mean for a regular uh, certificate and even the other four who did it were not part of the team but who been trained in it we were okay without this but i think as we go on and if it really becomes a need of course we'll go out there and try and find a, a certificate for it right yes. yeah Perfect. especially if you're going i mean for training other people around the country for instance surely um, and it have to be yeah. accredited and things like that yes correct correct uh so there's a question on residential facilities we have many residential facilities available in india now uh first of all are there any guidelines available and if there are what are the monitoring and rating systems to see whether they follow the guidelines can i just, you know uh, when i was in national trust we had tried to set up minimal minimum standards for residential facilities and we brought out a little book but it never mm. became a formal guideline really it was mm. something that was recommended to uh, uh, residential facilities so we really haven't looked at that we actually at the moment since we're looking at we would like to look at group homes maybe uh, right. but we are we are at the moment only really want to focus on different kinds of homes in different right. kinds of settings because i think that's step 1 if we th think about support system in the community and how can we formalize it and of course uh, these minimum standards national trust had brought them out as a kind of a recommendatory uh, guidelines but uh, no formal guidelines so to say are there as far as i know right right yep shivani uh, so just adding to that uh, i mean if we look at uh, residential homes for the older people there is a much more de demand for creating accessibility and mm. i think they are looking at it more seriously as compared to residential facilities for persons with disabilities it could also be because residential facilities is not something that the disability sector really even wants and they want communities to become more inclusive and that could be one of the reasons why but i just wanted to bring that out that uh, residences for whom uh, older people uh, are uh, looking more in at accessibility and home modifications as compared to the disability sector right right okay that's a valid point uh, there's a comment here and if there's anybody has any questions you know now is the time to ask uh, i'm sure a lot of people would be interested in receiving training it would help in adopting a structured approach to the problem so i think we all agree wholeheartedly on that a question for krishna and uh, uh, veda 
what was most surprising from your case studies and from the expo? What, what kind of shook, I mean, you know, stood out as this is not what I was expecting? Mm -hmm. So, shall I answer that? Yeah, go ahead, Aveda. Uh, so, uh, uh, as the expo, is con expo was concerned, uh, like, uh, and the impact slide, all the achievements, you know, uh, were shared, like, which include the requested that which was, you know, uh, part of the feedback which was received from the public. So, as we kind of received, uh, like, positive feedbacks, like, you know, this was a great initiative, we did uh, receive uh, certain, like, requests and suggestions uh, saying that, you know, there were no uh, sufficient aids for persons with hearing, uh, like, hearing impaired. And, uh, like, you know, there were uh, a certain activity, like, requests for aids for certain specific activities. So, like, we felt like those were all valid. Uh, like, you know, we thought, like, we, uh, with a, we had to, like, for the expo was concerned, like we had to work within a time constraint. Uh, so like we like kind of reached out to organizations who were like who had their uh, resources available for procurement. And uh, like, so like within the time constraint, we were, uh, like possible, like what, how much of aids were possible to be procured, we just kind of uh, got in. And uh, like, you know, those uh, feedbacks were valid actually. Like, uh, like, and we thought like we could kind of uh, bring it in when we are kind of the, uh, bringing the museum of possibilities, which is like an upcoming project. So we just thought like we can kind of in, incorporate those uh, like uh, drawbacks or shortcomings, which we kind of experienced in the expo. And uh, when the case study is concerned, uh, we, uh, I, uh, let's not say like it's a shocking thing. Like we just felt like there were a few challenges which we kind of experienced. Uh, one was the very level of acceptance. Like, you know, uh, like since the training was part of Vidya Saga, uh, so like most uh, most of the case studies were like alumni of Vidya Saga. So like many were already aware uh, like of being uh, and were open to kind of modify their home to make it more accessible. But there were certain factors which were kind of standing as barriers like financial uh, elements and most of the uh, case studies were like in rented spaces so though their family and the stakeholder were open for changes uh, there was a little hesitance to kind of approach the association and the kind of like the house owner to convince them to make uh, like a permanent change because changes when it comes to making uh, homes accessible it's not not only about getting a, a new product and kind of bringing it to home it's also about some permanent changes so that was one of the challenge and uh, one other major challenge was like whenever we were suggesting few uh, recommendations, there were no uh, like a ready-made facility where people can go try it out and then kind of convince themselves to like make sure that this is going to be suitable for me. And so I can just bring it like, you know, incorporate it in my home. So there was no like a ready-made facility where people can go try it out. So like PM Expo was just like a example of that. So, like when we kind of uh, brought in TN Expo, we uh, we kind of uh, approached our stakeholders, asked them to kind of visit the expo, try it out, uh, try out those assistive aids, and like you know, this was like a like very good balance between the challenge we faced during the case study as well as like you know the, ex the impact the expo created because of that. Right. Right. Okay. Um, couple of questions. Sure. Can I just add yeah. one point to what Veda said? Yeah. yeah. So uh, since she was mentioning about the attitudinal barriers, uh, and you know, all, uh, and even when Poonamaka highlighted that you know the change is like not massive, and even a small uh, modification man can make a huge difference. So when we invited uh, our uh, you know uh, people who approached us to come and visit the TN Expo, uh, parents became very uh, you know enthusiastic. So they called call back and. Apart from whatever we suggested, they saw many product which was available in the TN Expo, and they started approaching us whether you know that would be suitable to their daughter or like for self advocates. And if they try, they like, can I use this? So that's that's one of the reason you know the importance of why we should have a model where people can actually come and try, take a first hand experience before you know implementing or making a you know massive change or you know investing in it. Right, right. Um, thank you. So there's a question, um, is there scope for converting the needs of residential 
not converting, sorry, converging the needs of residential facilities for elderly people with that of persons with disabilities. And I think to me, it's not just about facilities. I think it could even be at home, right? So in a home, people as they age also acquire disabilities. And, uh, you know, we do not consider options for them to continue to stay independent as much. So uh, to me, I think it's not just about a residential facility, but it's also about at home. Um, but any, any thoughts on this Poonam or Shivani? So I think you're very right, Aparna. In a home, there's a, there's a whole age, there's so many different ages and there will be the elderly also at home who may need the same facilities. I mean, I, it, I have seen that in many places in other countries where the older people are using some of the same assistive devices as people with disabilities. So, of course, when we are looking at the home and also we, when we're talking to the family, the parents are aging, their needs are also there. So when you look at the, how, how, the plan that you make for the accessible home, will mm -hmm. take into consideration the elderly as well as the um, aging parents and their needs in the future, as well right. as the Right, I don't right. Know about this, uh, older people and people with disabilities, because we're trying to we're trying to actually promote the institutionalization. Let's try and see if we can get people with disabilities in the community in group homes. But yeah, of course, there will also be residential facilities, and yeah, that could also exist. I mean, I I think. You need to look at the whole range of kind of facilities and people can choose where they want to live. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's a question. We need to create a rating system to bring in accountability. How should we go about it? For access and homes? I guess, yeah, for accessibility. Um, just checking, uh, Fizar, you're not doing any more uh, closed yeah, captioning, is, is it? it? No, the captioning is there. Oh, oh I am. I'm, I'm trying to keep up. Uh, can I just request yeah, yeah. everyone to speak a little slowly? It's fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, no, I understand. Yeah, 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 this is this is the unplanned part, so it just <laughs> takes time. Yeah, I uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, all right. So can I answer that? Sure, rating, sure, uh, sure. Yeah, yes, please. Thing? Yes, please. See, uh, if we are looking at rating home modifications, mm -hmm. then it is not possible. Because mm -hmm. home modification is an individual requirement yeah. and it is customized. Mm -hmm. And the individual has to make that demand. So right. it's not possible. But when we come to accessibility, I think can everything it. can be rated because it is based on standards of design. So there is a criteria. So when we look at the green building uh, rating system, the green building rating system sometimes, uh, actually always, also has accessibility as a criteria. But may I remind you again that this is for public space accessibility and not for private space and personal space accessibility. You know, yeah. Can I add? Uh, yeah, I think I agree with what Shivani is saying. Can I just add, Aparna? Sure. See, when you're talking about accessible house home for the person, uh, the basic thing is uh, it's not about rating. It, I, I totally agree with Shivani. You see, you got to actually. Uh, the, per the person has many dreams and aspirations. She wants to cook a meal. She wants to be. She wants to be able to open the fridge to take out things that she wants. It's also not disability specific. It's actually person specific what your needs are. But uh, sometimes Tara will also have to help the person think through what all they want in their home made accessible. Like mm -hmm. somebody has an aspiration for gardening. Somebody has an aspiration for cooking. Somebody has an aspiration for, uh, uh, you, you know, having a good study table where I can paint or draw. So mm. you, you need to think of that person's aspirations and work out your accessible scheme. Because one right. thing in India, we're working in very small spaces where a large number of people live. 
So we we need to look at everybody's needs. Mm. I don't think I agree. I, I, I we haven't even thought about rating actually, mm. but I don't think that's needed or possible. Right. Personally. Right. Yeah. Um, this is a question from, is there support from TN government to build accessible homes for persons with disability who are underprivileged? Are there schemes? There, there are not, but we are hoping, that's what we want, that's our next step that we would like to work in that space. We would like to work with the state government to see how we can ensure uh, housing which is accessible for people with disabilities. We would also like uh, to see if group homes can be made, uh, you know, where, where can we have group homes if people want to live together and if, can they be accessible? So uh, we hopefully, let's see if we can work on that. We haven't really started on that yet, but what we have okay. started on is yeah. with the government to create this accessible home, which Veda presented. Okay. Uh, Shivani, you wanted so to I add? I just wanted to add uh, the, the nationally, it's a national scheme, which is the Indra Avas Yojana, which uh, uh, provides housing, uh, addresses housing issues for the underprivileged. So, yeah, but as Poonamdi said, it does not address accessibility. So there are schemes uh, already existing. There would also be a scheme for urban housing, and uh, even if, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm from Delhi, so I know the DDA and the similar of DDA in Tamil Nadu would be also building, you know, one bedroom flats and the low uh, income flats, but none of these address accessibility. Mm -hmm. So schemes exist, but they do not address accessibility. Right, right. I, and the continuation of that earlier question on rating system to bring in accountability, the clarification is they're looking for a rating system for residential facilities. Uh, Thank you. But I, I guess... Think, uh, as uh, uh, part of National Trust, uh, I want to say that, that when we set up the Gharonda scheme and the Samar scheme as residential facilities and National Trust, we did try to do that. We, a rating system for the Samarth and the Karonda schemes. And that's when we worked on a booklet on the minimum standards in terms mm. of life and air and hygiene and toilets and beds and uh, you know the amount of space that is needed per person. We did that kind of a minimum standards in National Trust for residential facilities. Mm. And uh, I, I think we need to do more work in that space because that's a big issue. Right. Right. But it needs better funding also from National Trust for organizations who are setting up these residential facilities. Okay. Okay. I think we have kind of, we are almost approaching the two hour mark for this webinar. So we should wind up and I don't think we have any open questions as far as I can see. Um, so I think we will be putting up the, we will send out to people who are on Zoom, um, with you've logged in with your email, so we'll send out the PowerPoints and the, you know, the link to the brochure of, of Tara as well and the contact details. Uh, and for anybody else, you can contact us on the Patients Engage uh, Facebook page as well. And I think uh, I would really like to. Okay, I'm just still. I think there's a few more comments, but I think we'll. I just want to, okay, I'll just say this before I say my thank you. I just want to say that the new flat system, the accessibility of persons, sorry, I'm going very fast, Rajesh and Fiza, uh, accessibility of persons with disabilities is not taken care of. Governments are not sensitive about the PWDs, the contractors and property dealers need strict orders in order to follow minimum standards. Uh, so yeah, I think it's just a comment. Okay, um, so thank you on behalf of uh, Patients Engage and you know, I'd really like to thank Shivani and Poonam uh, and the Tara team, especially Krishna, Veda, who've worked with main, many dry runs to make this accessible for all of us as well. And I think uh, Fiza and Rajesh have been the most hardworking. We've had periods where we've not been doing stuff, but the two of them have been 
continuously working through. So thank you, Rajesh and Fiza, for all your efforts. Uh, and thank you to the audience. So I think we had max attendance in terms of, you know, cross the, hit the Zoom limit as well. Um, and yes, and, and people stayed for so long, at least a lot of them. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Poonam. Thank you, Shivani, thank you. Krishna. And we would be, I just want to add that we'd be very happy to be in touch with any of the people who attended and, you know, take the conversation yeah. further. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.